Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Vlogatos. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible Truth series, we go through the Word together, chapter and verse. And uh, we are actually wrapping up Second Corinthians now, uh, with the intention of you know going, hitting Isaiah and then going back over to uh, Matthew or not Matthew, Mark. Excuse me, Mark. And you know, like I mentioned before, we want to we got to break it up. We can't read we read the Gospels in succession. It would just get very redundant and uh, very similar if we went through all of the epistles as well, you know. And so uh, here we are. Let's go ahead and, and pray and then we'll wrap this up. Father, I thank you so much for your goodness and mercy. Thank you, Lord, that you're with us even when we cannot see, that you have a plan we cannot know. Uh, we know in part, as the word said, we know in part, we prophesy in part. And so we trust you with the rest that we don't know. We do everything that we can and then trust you with the rest that we can't. And so I thank you, Father God. I ask that you would help us to uh, uh, interpret this word, help us to get this word deep, deep down in our heart and help us so that it will undergird us and we will speak it with conviction and watch things change as we uh, come into agreement with the things that you speak and the plans that you want to bring forth in our lives. Um, and in Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. Okay, so uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So Paul is, is uh, you know, writing to the church here. He says, I, I hope you will pull up with uh, excuse me, I hope you will put up with a little more of my foolishness. Please bear with me, for I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ, but I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted, just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. You happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach or a different kind of spirit than the one you received, or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. But I don't consider myself inferior to, in any way to these super apostles. He has that in you know, quotes because that's the context. He's being a little sarcastic. Who teach such things. I may be unskilled as a speaker, but I'm not lacking in knowledge. We have made this clear to you in every possible way. So again, he's dealing with a church that um, you know, when we saw before, when he wrote to them in First Corinthians, he was talking about how they were uh, they were beset with divisions, and he was saying that's a sign of spiritual immaturity. And uh, so now, what he's saying is that apparently what's happening is there's these uh, people coming in who have claimed the title of apostle, and they are speaking things contrary to the doctrine that Paul and his ministry team established when they first came to Corinth. So they're teaching, and, and really we, we know uh, from history the kind of things that they were teaching, you know, the, the Gnostics and people like that that were teaching that Jesus didn't come in a flesh and blood body and things like that. And, and uh, so Paul is like, you need to reject that nonsense. And so he's, he is saying that he had um, kind of come into, uh, he's, he, when he, said, he opened up this chapter by saying, please put up with a bit more of my foolishness. So now he's talking about how... Um, the things that he has done in their presence as a way to try to bring them back to that first uh, passion that they had when he first came with the gospel of Jesus. And uh, so he's he doesn't want to compare himself with them, but he feels like he has to. And so he says, uh, verse 7, Was I wrong when I humbled myself and honored you by preaching God's good news to you without expecting anything in return? I robbed, and he has quotes there, other churches by accepting their contributions so I could serve you at no cost. And when I was with you and didn't have enough to live on, I did not become a financial burden to anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia brought me all that I needed. I had never been a burden to you, and I never will be. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, no one in all of Greece will ever stop me from boasting about this. Why? Because I don't love you? God knows that I do. So, you know, He's talked before about how uh, ministers should be paid, but he did, he he opted out of that payment because he wanted to be able to say, "Look, I you can't even accuse me you can't you can't accuse me of taking advantage of you in any way because you know that I never even took up an offering." He's like the other churches uh, supplied my needs so that I wouldn't have to take up an offering from you so that I'd be able to preach full time, is what he's telling him. So, uh, verse twelve. But I will continue doing what I have always done. This will undercut those who are looking for an opportunity to boast that their work is just like ours. These people are false apostles. They are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. But I am not surprised. 
Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is of no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they will get the punishment their wicked deeds deserve. Again, I say, don't think that I am a fool to talk like this. But even if you do, listen to me, as you would to a foolish person, while I also boast a little. Such boasting is not from the Lord, but I am acting like a fool. And since others boast about their human achievements, I will too. After all, you think you are so wise, but you enjoy putting up with fools. You put up with it when someone enslaves you, takes everything you have, takes advantage of you, takes control of everything, and slaps you in the face. I'm ashamed to say that we've been too weak to do that. And again, there's that quote unquote because he's, you know, he's he's putting them on a bit of a guilt trip. You know, he's like we, you know, we never did that. We don't act like these people do. And I and we, you know, anyone who spent some time in the church and and spent some time, um, you know, obs- observing some of the things that some some supposed ministers do they've we have seen behavior like this even in the modern church today and people do seem willing to put up with it and and um you know there's um you know promises that they can't keep and and you know you give them so much money and you'll see this thing happen in your life and that's not even scriptural you know um and so paul is very upset about it and so we're still in verse 21. He says, But whatever they dare to boast about, I am talking like a fool again. I dare to boast about it too. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me thirty-nine lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers, but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty, and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold, without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then, besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my feeling that weakness? Who is led astray, and I do not burn with anger? If I must boast... I would rather boast about the things that show how weak I am. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, who is worthy of eternal praise, knows I am not lying. When I was in Damascus, the governor under King Eratos kept guards at the city gates to catch me. I had to be lowered in a basket through a window in the city wall to escape from him. And he goes on from here, but I'm going to take a, a moment to to um, you know talk about. See, yeah, Paul, Paul went through all these things, and uh, really, it's no different than what the prophets in the Old Testament went through. Jesus talked about how they were mistreated as well. And it's it's really a parallel because um, you see in the Old Testament prophets them, you know, uh, and we've we've gone through it many, you know, we've gone through a lot of that on Blog of We'll, we'll uh, go back through more of that when we come out of the New Testament. We'll go back in and uh, finish up the other side when we go through Chronicles. But we went through the side on Kings uh, that we outlined in, in the bookmarks. And so um, we saw there was a lot of, you know, when we just read what the prophets wrote, it can look like maybe they were out on some, you know, castle rampart somewhere, some kind of prestigious high and lofty place speaking these things out. But they were crying, crying this uh, out, what they were crying out to the people because their their primary ministry was to was to woo the people back to God. And they were like. You're going astray. You need to come back. And so we could, we could, if we just read it, um, we can get the sense that they are like kind of like um, like a like a on a on a holy hill or something, you know, something like like that, like uh, like they weren't persecuted at all. But Jesus talked about how they were persecuted. The prophets were persecuted because they were saying to the people who were going astray, "Come back. God is calling you back." And yeah, it's true. A lot of their messages contained a lot of harsh language because God was telling them, "If you don't come back, I'm going to exile you to Babylon." Yeah, I mean, he he didn't didn't use the name Babylon, but he talked about how he was going to exile them if they would not return. So they didn't like the message, and God wasn't 
um, physically there behind the prophet, so they didn't feel any fear to take those prophets and do all kinds of terrible things to them because they didn't like what they were saying. And that's the same thing that they did to Jesus. It's the same thing that they did to Paul. Paul's talking about it right now. And so Jesus told us this, that, that we'd be persecuted for, for preaching him. He said, people will hate you because you're my followers. Because, uh, and Jesus told us why. He said, the world hates me because I testify of it that his works are evil. It's necessary to bear witness to the truth of the matter in order to show people the need for a savior. Otherwise, they, they don't feel like they need one. That's why if you do away with that side of the gospel message, then all we have is, well, we're left with apparently, well, God loves everybody and accepts everybody. He does, but only if they're willing to um, accept him and follow what he says is right. And so um, Paul's dealing with this same kind of thing now. So chapter 12, he says, this boasting will do no good, but I must go on. I will reluctantly tell about visions and revelations from the Lord. I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. And so just a brief explanation then. Um, the first heaven would be uh, the, you know, the atmosphere in which we operate. You know, we've got oxygen and, and CO2 and all that, you know, and underneath this, um, you know, inside this atmosphere that we have on the earth. The second heaven then would be space. And then the third heaven would be in the heavenlies, what, uh, you know, we refer to as, um, I mean, as the heavenlies, you know, this, it's, it's that spiritual realm beyond the physical. This is what Paul's talking about. He was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words, things no human is allowed to tell. That experience is worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. In other words, he's like, I'm not going to go into detail about what I heard and saw. I will boast only about my weaknesses. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so, because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it, because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life, or hear in my message. So he's not claiming to have some extra special knowledge by which the people should reverence him. And there are people who do that. They had some dream, they had some revelation, they had some vision, and they expect people to follow them and listen to their teaching just because of those things. And Paul's like, yeah, I, I had, I've got some special revelation. I, I, I saw some stuff, but I'm not even going to say what it was. He's like, I, want, I don't want you to partner with me based on anything that you can see in my ministry that I am accomplishing here. And that's, uh, that's a good litmus test. You know, um, if a minister is willing to do the work and be above reproach in doing that, then they're probably somebody worth partnering with. Okay, so uh, verse 7, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in, weak, in weakness. And so, uh, he, he, I'm going to go ahead and finish that verse. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ can work through me. All right, so he's not talking about, now, a lot of people, this is, you know, what people refer to as Paul's thorn in the flesh. And this has become a uh, kind of a sticking point for people. And I don't really get it, but uh, he, he makes it clear it's it's a... It's a demonic entity. It's it's a it's a demon. Um, why? Because it's a messenger from Satan. It's a thorn in my flesh. In the Old Testament, uh, God told the people that uh, if they worship the idols of the people in the land, that those people would become thorns in their flesh. Um, you know. So it, when you're talking about a thorn in this context, you're talking about an individual, a person. You know. Um, and so. Paul is talking about being demonically oppressed. Uh, he's not talking about a physical ailment. Um, some people have speculated on these things, but it doesn't actually say that. It says a messenger from Satan, and I think the Bible says what it means. It means what it says. And so um, he also he we need to we need to realize here that Jesus did not tell him no when he said, "Please take it away from me." Jesus said, my grace is, a, is all you need. My power works best in weakness. He's not saying that he's, that he's going to leave it there because it causes Paul a weakness. He is saying, my grace is all you need. 
And so grace, then, the definition of grace is getting good things from God that you don't deserve. That would include being set free from some demonic oppression. So is it possible? It doesn't say that Paul uh, got rid of it, but it doesn't say that he didn't. So we need to take the word for what the word says. Uh, Paul is saying, I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses. Okay, so uh, being demonically oppressed is not a weakness on the part of the person who is being oppressed. They're just being oppressed. And so freedom comes by the authority of the name of Jesus. Jesus says, cast out demons with a word. And so Jesus was saying, my grace is all you need. Now, Jesus told us when he ascended, he's like, you will cast out demons. So he wasn't, he's not doing that now. He delegated that to us. It's quite clear. Um, so anyway, so basically I believe that Jesus was telling Paul, you have what you need to take care of this. So do it. All right. But that's my personal, my personal take on it. Um, so I'm not going to teach it as doctrine. I'm just saying, take the word for what the word said. It doesn't say that the situation was resolved, although I do believe it was. That's just my personal belief. So verse 10, that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So what's he saying? My strength comes from Jesus, whose strength is perfected in weakness. Paul's already talked about how just this physical vessel, this, this physical body that we have is weak. And so that in and of itself, we have to rely on Jesus for anything that we need spiritually. And so then uh, that's the context he's talking about is when I'm weak, then I'm strong. In other words, when I acknowledge the weakness of my physical, my physical nature, then I am acknowledging that I need something beyond myself, which is Jesus himself. And so if his if his strength is perfected in weakness and i acknowledge that i need him uh by by reason of my the weakness of my physical nature now i have uh potential to accept the strength that jesus has for me so for when i when i acknowledge that i'm weak then I, I i'm strong in other words is what i'm trying to get across here so then verse 11 he, he says you have made me act like a fool you ought to be writing commendations for me for I am not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing at all. It's a strong statement. When I was with you, I certainly gave you proof that I am an apostle. For I patiently did many signs and wonders and miracles among you. The only thing I failed to do, which I do in the other churches, was to become a financial burden to you. Please forgive me for this wrong. See, he, he, he's, he's very irritated that they... Um, are giving ear to these false apostles that are coming their way and, and giving them all this money. And Paul's like, I never took a dime. I didn't, I never took it. And he's like, and you're listening to them more than you're listening to me. And you're writing letters of recommendation for them. And he's like, and he's like, I didn't ask for a letter of recommendation. I didn't ask for your money. And they asked for both of those things. And yet they're mistreating you. Why are you letting them do that? It's basically what he's saying. Verse 14. Now I am coming to you for the third time and I will not be a burden to you. I don't want what you have. I want you. After all, children don't provide for their parents. Rather, parents provide for their children. I will gladly spend myself and all I have for you, even though it seems the more I love you, the less you love me. Some of you admit I was not a burden to you, but others still think I was sneaky and took advantage of you by trickery. But how? Did any of the men I sent to you take advantage of you? When I urged Titus to visit you and sent our, brother, our other brother with him, did Titus take advantage of you? No. For we have the same spirit, and walk in each other's steps, doing things the same way. Perhaps you think we're saying these things just to defend ourselves. No, we tell you this as Christ's servants, and with God as our witness. Everything we do, dear friends, is to strengthen you. For I am afraid that when I come, I won't like what I find, and you won't like my response. I am afraid that I will find quarreling, jealousy, anger, selfishness, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorderly behavior. Yes, I am afraid that when I come again, God will humble me in your presence, and I will be grieved because many of you have not given up your old sins. And next line, I have a couple of words highlighted out here. You have not repented of your impurity, 
and eagerness for lustful, eagerness for lustful pleasure. Chapter 13. This is the third time I am coming to visit you. And as the scriptures say, the facts of every case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I have already warned those who had been sinning when I was there on my second visit. Now I again warn them and all others, just as I did before, that the next time I will not spare them. I will give you all the proof you want that Christ speaks through me. Christ is not weak when he deals with you. He is powerful among you. Although he was crucified in weakness, he now lives by the power of God. We too are weak, just as Christ was. But when we deal with you, we will be alive with him and will have God's power. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. As you test yourselves, I hope you will recognize that we have not failed the test of apostolic authority. We pray to God that you will not do what is wrong by refusing our correction. So he's saying that because of the authority established when he came to uh, preach the gospel to them the first time, uh, that he has the right to correct them. Uh, so he's saying, test yourselves and correct, thank you, test yourselves and take care of this so that I won't have to correct you. It's the same thing with God. God doesn't want to judge anybody. He will if he has to, but that's not what he wants. He wants people to repent so that he doesn't, so that there's no need for judgment. And so Paul's really saying the same thing. You know, it's, it's really just a, um, you know, a reflection of that judgment that comes from, from above. And Paul is saying, he, he's like, I, you know, he, he's like, I don't, uh, I don't want to do this. He says, test yourselves. And then he says, uh, we have not failed the test of apostolic authority. In other words, the word again, the word apostle means the sent one. And we talked about how God has sent certain people to certain places. And, and in so doing, he has placed them into an office of being an apostle. Because in the broadest sense, we all are because we're all sent. Jesus sent us all. But not everybody is standing in the office of an apostle. That's a different thing entirely. And so he says, we have apostolic authority. In other words, we have the authority of, uh, 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 over, over you because we were sent to you and we established the work there. That's what makes it apostolic authority, you see. So uh, it sounds like a complicated term, but it's not really. He's like, we, he's just saying, this is the type of authority we have. It's the authority of the one who was sent on the, by Jesus on his behalf to start a new work with you. And the work that was established was good. And so we have authority over it. You see, he says, I hope, this is verse seven. I hope we don't need to demonstrate our authority when we arrive. Do the right thing before we come. Even if that makes it look like we have failed to demonstrate our authority. For we cannot oppose the truth, but must always stand for the truth. We are glad to seem weak if it helps show that you are actually strong. We pray that you will become mature. I am writing this to you before I come, hoping that I won't need to deal severely with you when I do come. For I want to use the authority the Lord has given me to strengthen you, not to tear you down. Dear brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these last words. Be joyful, grow to maturity, encourage each other, live in harmony and peace. Then the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet each other with a sacred kiss. All of God's people here send you their greetings. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Yeah, so you gotta you gotta to give it to Paul. You know, it seems like he's really letting him have it, but then at the end he's like, "I'm telling you, I want you to change your ways." Uh, he's like, I'm, "I'm willing to look weak if it means that you you look strong. If you've changed your ways before we get there, I'm fine looking weak." And then he gives him this last encouragement: "Be joyful," you know. And so he's giving them a refresher. Of, this is this is just do just do these things. Just just walk in love, you know, and everything will be okay. Is is what he's telling them. So, uh, praise God for that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you once again for your, your wisdom that you express in your word. The Bible calls that a manifold wisdom. Your, your wisdom is many-sided, and it covers and touches every need of our lives. Um, and it, it takes us responding to your wisdom 
and obeying what you say and walking in your steps and walking in the love that you express to us. I thank you for all these things. I ask your blessing upon all those who tune in here with me. And in Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Well, bless you guys, and we will see you again.